Hey, welcome everyone. Um, we're going to be uh, talking about time series today. And my name is Evan. Um, I uh, feel free to follow me on Twitter, you know, stuff, post all random stuff, especially if you like photography. So I, I've been uh, doing big data for a long time and like Scala for something like five, six years and uh, done uh, everything in a big data stack uh, pretty much, but being especially involved in the Spark and Cassandra communities. And, um, and recently I've been working on time series at scale, so that's one I want to talk to you about today, uh, about uh, developing and, and scaling out a time series solution and what we learned. So, um, so time series, what are we uh, really talking about? You know, the world is filled with uh, stuff like this. Who cares about operational metrics in the room? It was a show of hands. That's pretty much, you know, m most people probably. Um, so we all want to see what's going on uh, in our systems, right? What, what are some requirements that we might have for, um, for a solution that deals with a lot of metrics and time series? Uh, the, the first is uh, might might be scale, right? It, it is uh, is becoming more and more common where you have uh, you know you have tons of connected devices in the world. You have e even small even small companies uh, has could easily have many many thousands of you know machines uh, or, or more um, in the cloud. You know anybody can scale up easily using cloud services now, right? So so for the first thing is we're talking about. Um, is that we have a massive amount of, of data that's coming away that we want to analyze very quickly. Um, resiliency and uptime are very important things for these kind of systems, especially in the area of operational metrics. When uh, folks are worried about their systems going down, then your system has to be the one that is up all the time. Right? That's, that's an important requirement. Real time. This word is thrown around a lot. What do we really mean by real time? Uh, what I would uh, consider real time is, is, is basically the time that it takes from when an event happens to when you are able to observe it or know about it, right? And for things like operational metrics, you really want this to be in, in the seconds, um, as, as low as possible, right? Because as soon as something happens, you know, people, you want to be able to alert on it, you want to know about it. And then there's low latency. Uh, to me, latency is more about um, how fast you can get your answers. And you know, so real time is that it shows up quickly. La you know, latency is, means a lot of different things. But um, in this case, what I'm talking about is that you can get at the answers that you want from such a system in a very low amount of time. Imagine you're, you're thinking of like these systems usually being used in, say, dashboards. So you might have thousands of dashboards. Right, the, the, and you might have many thousands of alerts. Um, how quickly do you think queries need to be to, you know, make a dashboard display reasonably effective? What would what would you guess? I mean, usually you're talking about something that, you know, usually it's like say in the you know you know quite substantially sub second. Like, I think. You know, you would typically like want 99 percentile to be no worse than, say, you know, a second, which means that typically you want things to come back, you know, substantially sub-second. And the the other thing that is really important is becoming more and more important. Um, maybe in the old days, like you know, you would say send 10 metrics, and maybe you get back that one, met, you know, the one metric you're interested in, or the you know two or five, whatever, and you plot it. But it's it's becoming the world is becoming increasingly more complex, where folks are looking for more complex answers. They're looking for correlations. They're looking for um, more complex queries. It, so so now these systems, like time series systems, are becoming more and more um, ad hoc. And uh, some feedback that we got from users of existing systems uh, is that folks want a flexible data model. So um, they want to be able to tag uh, their metrics with uh, different values. Um, so they want to be able to organize their, their data, their metrics in different ways, 
and to be able to, to query across them and to not be restricted by certain data models. Like for example, a hierarchical data model would restrict you to querying at certain levels of the hierarchy, but, but that's not what users wanted. The other feedback that we got from, from people was that um, folks wanted longer views of granular data. An example of this is that, you know, it's Monday morning, you come in, some, some, something happened, you know, and you kind of want to look back, maybe it happened on, say, Saturday morning. So you want to kind of look back and see what happened. If, if you're getting um, something that is downsampled, then it becomes harder, it might become harder to debug something because you're looking for a certain, like, you know, thing that's going on. So people wanted uh, uh, to see fine grain data for as long as possible. You also want to design uh, for the cloud. What, what does this mean? So the, the world is moving towards things like Kubernetes. The world is moving towards stateless containers. And, and this has two major implications. Uh, one is that if, if you want to run your thing on the cloud, um, increasingly you're going to leverage hosted storage solutions. So you're looking at um, things like Dynamo. You're looking at like more and more people are letting um, somebody else you know, manage your state. Right, so, that, so, so, that, so that's one design criteria we're designed for. The other thing is that uh, because containers are stateless, um, systems, you have to be prepared for them to be started, uh, sorry, restarted uh, you know, at, at random. And this actually creates a lot more load for a monitoring system. Uh, increasingly, like what, how do you identify uh, each metric? It might be, you know, you, you definitely identify it by application, but increasingly, like, the container ID might be something that's important. And every time something gets restarted, you have a new container, which leads to more and more metrics. Ultimately, you, you see that uh, where we're going is that we have, we have things flowing into the system, events, metrics, you know, tracing, IoT, and, and we're trying to get stuff out as quickly as we can in as real time as possible. So what, what goes into this cloud and you know, how can we build it are, are some themes of today. So I'm going to, I have the pleasure of, uh, I say, reintroducing you to Father Doobie because uh, some of you might be here from last year, I'm not really sure. Um, I talked about our project, Father Doobie, but we've taken this in a different direction. Um, it, it is now a distributed in memory time series database, uh, which is geared for a super real time uh, very fast insights uh, uh, kind of stuff for a massive number of entities, which means a huge amount of metrics, and it is open source, so you can find it there. It is built on a couple of core principles. One of them is that it is designed for uh, the cloud, as I had mentioned, that uh, designed to deploy into cloud environments uh, as well as, as to monitor cloud infrastructure. Uh, built for scale, th th I don't really need to explain this uh, too much. We'll go into this in a bit uh, more detail, um, but uh, it has to horizontally scale and be resilient to failures. Uh, two important points, though, are that we want systems to be multi-tenant and to have a flexible data model. So uh, this is because <coughs> if you want a system to work in a large organization, then um, you can't really take a one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, some folks might have legacy data that are of a certain format. Uh, some folks might have different kinds of SLAs. And so you need a system that is able to adapt uh, concurrently to these different requirements. And this system, the Time Series Database, is proudly built on uh, the stack that uh, we talk about this conference, uh, Scala, Akka, Cassandra, Kafka, uh, and those are some type safe, uh, sorry, type level symbols, if anyone knows that. that. This one is Monix, by the way. I don't know if anyone recognized that, but um, pretty good stuff. So let's talk about solving the time series problem. What is the time series problem? This is a slide from uh, PromCon. So think of it like you have tons of, let's say, like a million different time series that are coming in on a regular basis. What is the right pattern like? How is data coming in? So you'll find that it comes in kind of like, uh, it comes in 
vertically here. So each of these are different time series, and you might get like one point you know, every n seconds or something. So it's kind of coming like this, right? It's going do do then it goes do do I mean, not like in, in sequence like that, but, but overall, it kind of, the right pattern is like this. The problem, though, is that what you want to read, this is not, this is not the pattern that you want to read. Right? In, in fact, the read patterns are almost exactly opposite. You find that I, I, you know, I might be looking at you know, one series of data, then another series of data, and kind of doing things with it. So the read and write patterns are almost completely opposite. And when the number of items that you're dealing with are in the many millions, this becomes a problem. Like, what do you optimize for? If you optimize for writes, then you might end up with somewhere it is very inefficient to, to read. In, in the same way, right? If you optimize for reads, then it might become very expensive for writes, and time series databases are, after all, if, if they have to do anything, it is that they have to scale insanely for, for an insane amount of writes. So, so this is a fundamental problem of uh, TSDBs. About three years ago, Facebook came up with a landmark paper called the Gorilla Paper, and uh, they took a new approach to solving this problem. What they said was, you know, most people are really interested in recent data. So what we're going to do at Facebook is that we're going to keep this data in memory. And we're going to use uh, very efficient encoding techniques to fit as much stuff in memory as possible so that I can basically answer a lot of complicated queries uh, very quickly uh, using, using this uh, in-memory data. And we serve queries using a separate process so this allows you to uh, fit a lot of stuff and answer <laughs> queries quickly and solve this write pattern versus read pattern problem. They open sourced a like a tiny percentage of it, unfortunately. So basically, uh, all of us kind of ran around and um, scrambled uh, to, to see you know, how to build it ourselves. You know. um, around the same time, uh, the Prometheus project came about. How many folks have heard of Prometheus? So um, that's interesting. It's not, uh, not everyone in the room. So, so for those of you, I guess I should give a five second. So Prometheus is, is a very popular uh, time series solution that I'll talk about in a little bit. It, it came out around the same time using very similar principles. Uh, they were going to store a whole bunch of recent stuff in memory and use efficient techniques. Uh, it is, however, built for it is built for the Google uh, Borgmon kind of architecture, which means that every team is designed to run their own Prometheuses. So it's designed for it's designed to be single node by design. It is not designed to scale, which has a lot of implications. And, and this didn't really work for us, so we decided to um, build our own to build something that is scalable from the ground up. And uh, this is what a data flow might look like. So uh, imagine that you have, in one scenario, applications that are sending metrics, operational data, uh, to something that we call a gateway. The gateway instance then shards this data into a queue, Kafka. Kafka's role is, as in many systems, used for sharding, buffering, as well as replay of data so that you don't lose data. One thing that I'll note uh, is that it is necessary to accommodate different ways of ingesting data. So you have push going on, and you have pull going on uh, for different people, different kinds of network infrastructure means that you know, one or the other is going to work. The data is pulled from Kafka into a set of independent ValueDB nodes, and the data is then served rapidly to uh, various users, ad hoc users, dashboards, alerts. Now let's look a little bit at how this uh, data flows in. So data that is ingested at a high volume is a pretty good fit for streams, right? So we actually use Monix, which is an implementation of the reactive streams protocol. You, you've probably heard it many, many times in this conference. We like Monix a lot because it gives you the st a standard reactive streams and back pressure. 
data comes in, it flows, it gets indexed, it goes into what we call write buffers, which is a key abstraction for solving the write and read pattern uh, difference, is that data gets collected and then encoded into efficient chunks for each time series, and it gets written out. If there's any problems in any of these stages, what the reactive streams paradigm means is that uh, something that slows down later will also slow down the read, and, uh, and that means that uh, you can so that on the rest of your intake um, so that, you know, again, you're not like losing data. And one thing that Monix is really good at doing is that it gives you this complete uh, type safe back pressure API that is very easy to manipulate. But at the same time, uh, Monix is really designed for high performance. So you can control the threading and uh, a lot of details very, very precisely, which is a big bonus. So, so data comes in, you might ask, how is it that uh, we manage to fit a lot of data in memory? And we do this using uh, columnar compression. <coughs> so a, tra so a traditional uh, a record way of storing the data would be that, uh, let, let's take a really simple schema where for each uh, point that comes in, it consists of a timestamp and a value. Let's say the value is a double for purposes. So a normal way of storing this, you might, you, you might have a case class, right? Which is points, a data point. And that might have a timestamp and a value. So they would be stored next to each other in memory, and you would have a whole bunch of these. Which is, which is fine. This is the most logical way of representing this data. The only thing is that when you store data in this way, it, it, it's, it's really hard to uh, compress it. So what we do instead is that we store all the timestamps together, like T1 through T8 here, and the values together, V1 through V8. When you store data of the same type together, it's much easier to take advantage of techniques. Uh, and for example, um, we can look at the time data, and we can use, oops. Uh, yeah, that's right. So you take the time data, and it, you, would, you might say, you know what, timestamps for time series are likely to be increasing smoothly. So let me plot it on a graph, so to speak, and do a linear regression on it, and I will fit it to a line. And now I can represent this data as an intersection and a slope, and the delta from such a slope. So this technique is called delta-delta encoding, because we're taking the deltas, and there's also a delta this way. And what we find is that because of the mostly linear increasing nature of timestamps, that most of the time you can encode the deltas which are significantly smaller. Uh, you can take this a step further and say, you know, maybe people don't really care about timestamps below a certain resolution, like you know, a quarter second, right? So we, we can kind of throw away those deltas that are below a quarter second. And so you can do a lot of things like this to significantly reduce the amount of space that, that you use. Yeah. And the result of these techniques of storing data and memory using columnar compression, uh, delta encoding, and similar techniques, and a lot of optimization, is that uh, we're able to store millions of time series and many, many billions of data points in memory on a single node. Uh, we can actually ingest up to, a single node can ingest up to a million uh, data points a second uh, at, at peak, which is, I would say pretty impressive for a Scala JVM uh, language. Like this is not written in C++ books, you know. So, um, and this was this is about an order of magnitude better than the previous system which used uh, Storm and HBase. And we ha we can achieve storage densities which are fairly good for amount of data. I would say around say you know three bytes. It, this varies. It, I mean, this varies a lot really depending on exactly what. I mean, the data is like, but you know, like a couple bytes per metric sample, which is um, a lot better compressed than raw data. And because you're storing everything as a column, it lets you um, use a lot less space. Uh, so, a quick question. Yeah, how does this compare to Gorilla? So, so Gorilla, well, um, Gorilla is not something that uh, someone uh, can use. I would say we're not quite at Gorilla scale yet. You know, we have about, I don't know, 50% or something to go. Um, but 
you know, I think that's something we can improve over time. So, yeah. So you might ask, you're storing so many things, how do you store all this stuff, right? So tackling heap issues it was, is a, was a major area of development for this project. I think at the very beginning, you know, we're using so much memory when you build things naively that we ran into like really long pauses. And what that is, is that uh, because you're storing a lot of data, and if you store it on a heap, it gets collected in, uh, in your old generation. And um, it's, most, most of the Java GCs are really built for quickly cleaning up recent data, uh, because you can go through young gen very quickly. The old gen it has more objects and it takes longer to go through. So, so that takes longer, and you can get into loops uh, where the, uh, the GCU got stuck because you, know, you, are, you have so little free space that it's not able to, to work, and, and then you get into really long pauses. So, so our solution was to try to move as much of this data off heap as possible, which eliminated the pressure on, on the old generation. The other uh, major problem that we ran into is that the rate of ingest was uh, too high. I, don't, I know maybe you might run into this in various streaming systems as well, where uh, you're allocating things a lot on ingestion. You might be deserializing, you might be doing things. Uh, what we found was that uh, we used protobuf initially for the ingestion. This ended up actually taking too much space because you can imagine for each protobuf object, that might lead to a graph, right? So one object might contain, like, say, a map, you know, and, and that might be a list of tuples. Each tuple might then create another object. So this kind of balloons very quickly. So we created a custom uh, data structure that allows us to do zero allocations uh, on, on ingest. Uh, there's a couple of these that, if you're interested, you can look for in the open source code. Uh, one is our compressed columnar format called a binary vector, which is kind of like a vector in Scala. It's, it's a, an appendable list, and then, uh, but, and it, which can be compressed and read out in a compressed form. Another is a record type, which can support different schemas and uh, allows you to ingest data quickly with, uh, without allocation. And they use uh, something that we call a mem factory, where you pass this in, and just passing in different mem factories allows you to specify whether you want this data structure on heap or off heap, and exactly what kind of allocation strategy that you want to pursue. So this gives us a lot of flexibility. Um, moving, moving object graphs off heap. So this is a quick example of, of some of the optimizations that we did. Initially, we used a concurrent skip list map, which is a wonderful data structure. Well, it is a wonderful data structure until you need to have millions of copies of them. So a, um, a concurrent skip list map has a, an entry or a key value pair, right? So the key has to be an object, and the value has to be an object, too. And for us, the value pointed at other things, which pointed at chunks. So this created an object graph. And what we found was that even after moving certain things like these, these chunks to off heap, uh, if we, the normal pattern of doing this in the JVM is that you would have you know, classes and instances for referring to these things. But each uh, Java object takes up at least 24 bytes of memory. And if you multiply this graph <coughs> uh, times 24 times millions and millions of objects, it ends, still ends up using a huge amount of space. In fact, the amount of object overhead that was needed to store all this became a significant fraction of the actual data that we want to store. So what we did is that we moved this stuff into a bunch of off-heap data structures that point at uh, different things. And this allowed us to eliminate the overhead as well as uh, eliminate the GC pressure. So a system like this is not really useful unless you can query it, right? So you might be asking, how do we query something in a way that it allows for a huge amount of concurrency? Um, so what we did was we took a uh, departure. We used to use Spark as the query layer. Um, but for this project, we decided to build in a Prometheus uh, query incompatibility. This is nice because uh, folks that are in the monitoring world, like SREs, they, they are 
uh, they're all used to the Prometheus query language. If you're not familiar with it, I can kind of give you a really quick overview. Um, but supporting a popular query language is a, seems like a good thing because we don't have to reinvent a lot of other things. And we can get out of the box support from popular projects like Grafana. So this query, uh, suppose that you want to find out uh, for your HTTP service, you will find out, you want to find out for some given data center how many of them have occurred, and, and you want to find out maybe the top hosts that are giving you those requests, you know, or you want to just group them up by host. So, so here, this is like a really quick uh, PromQL query. What it does is you, you're putting a metric name in here, H3 requests, and then inside the curly brackets are a bunch of filters. So the filters, you can think of them as key value pairs that filter out the time series you're interested in. So in this case, I'm looking up a particular data center, I'm looking up a particular job number, and I'm going to sum them, uh, I'm going to do group by by, uh, by the host, and then I'm going to sum them up. So, so this is a really quick um, or succinct syntax that allows me to do a whole bunch of standard time series aggregations. And the whole thing is built on time windowing, which is another really important thing too for the TSDB. What you do is that once you have a query, first you have to parse it into a logical plan. So the logical plan at the bottom layer might be a bunch of filters that one of them is uh, this thing called underscore underscore name, which is for the metric name, and it gets you all the H3 requests. Then you might filter it some more by data center and by job and things like that. And then we might do some kind of time windowing on it, and we might then sum it up at a certain level. Now, the logical plan only tells us what to do. It doesn't really tell us where to carry out this work or exactly how to do it. So logical plans are then translated into a physical plan. Now for us, our system underneath is uh, ACA based, it is based on actors. And this is an important part. So the way that our physical plan works is that each step is carried out uh, at a certain uh, actor, which is mapped to a, a, a shard for us. So in this case, the physical plan consists of carrying out a lower level selection of time series and aggregations uh, at each shard. So this happens in a distributed manner. A higher level of the tree will then take the intermediate results and sum them up. Uh, now one really important uh, aspect of, of this as related to reactive systems is that we take full advantage of ACA's location transparency. How many folks know what location transparency is? Let's say, like, um, not as many hands as I thought, right? So. What, uh, so the way that ACA works is that it's an actor model, meaning that everything is an actor to which, from which you send messages. All you need to know when you send a message is the actor reference of another actor. It doesn't matter if it's local or remote. And, and that's what is meant by location transparency, is that the location of the destination actor doesn't matter. It can, and, and that is a really key concept. In our physical plans, we would have an actor reference, and so, you can easily change the layout of your query execution simply by assigning a different actor and changing, changing and, you know, to, to match your the desired topology. For example, maybe it's okay to do this upper level step in shard zero, but maybe we decide tomorrow that you know, this is not really optimal, it leads to unevenness in CPU or whatever, and I want to do this in an external service. So I'm gonna move out this code to a query service. Well, if I'm running things using actors, this becomes completely transparent with no change in code. Because all I have to do is, I want to say, I want to carry out this step in, in the actor over here, and, and that will let me carry out this plan using this new topology, and I can test it out really simply. In fact, you can even dynamically decide what is the right topology. Uh, based on a weighing of the cost of executing that query, which is, which is really nice. <coughs> Our actor hierarchy looks kind of like this. In each node, you know, at the top you might have, say, an HTTP uh, running ACA HTTP. 
and we would have a node coordinator which receives all the messages. The node coordinator will then forward things like, say, a query to underlying level of actors. So there would be a query actor, and this would then parse the query, and it would look at the execution plan and say, oh, you know, I can carry, I'm supposed to carry out this child plan on this other node. So then it will just forward that request to another node, and that gets carried out. So this is how we can have dynamic uh, query execution that, that we can optimize at runtime. I'm going to look at the, let's look at the data model a little bit, because this is sort of important to understand, because a lot of people talk about time series, and the term is thrown around a lot. So what, what is this, a system like this optimized for? I would say it is when you have a very high cardinality of time series. And exactly how we model that is up to you, but for us, we would model each individual uh, metric from a single instance of an application, for example, would be a separate uh, time series. And they would have points in time. So, so basically, you can think of uh, the time series being the most important part of your uh, primary key, so to speak, and time being the other part of your primary key. And a lot of things are keyed off of the specific time series and the kind of tags that you might have. The, um, the indexing system is based on this, so this is how you look up things and filter things. So, so this, this becomes, so having as many series as you can for fine-grained um, data is, is, um, is a key part of it. And this, this is sort of opposite from a traditional like SQL database or whatever, where you might have like a few tables. You know, maybe you have five, maybe you have ten, but you're not going to have like a million tables, right? Where, whereas this kind of, and what it, when I say time series database, the, the reason why this is very different from most, um, almost any other kind of uh, storage or database, is that. Um, it gives you the ability to track individual entities like at a very fine grained level. So I don't have to say, you know, let me group like these 100,000 um, you know, phones or whatever you know, to, uh, to this table and then fit, fit this other thing to this table. I can just track like each individual one and not really worry about sharding and things like that. Uh, the tags are done in such a way that any unique combination of keys and values automatically forms a unique time series. So let's say that I'm sending this time series that has shard equals zero, and then um, I decide to send one where I have data for shard equals one, then that automatically becomes a new time series. We have a namespacing mechanism called data sets. So FileDB is different in that it's a multi-schema database that we support different kinds of ingestion schemas. And this is used for, uh, the, there, this is an example of how we might namespace things uh, for, and, and this is a big help for multi-tenancy. So suppose that I have a main data set which has a two-day two retention policy. I might have a different one for what we call pre-aggregates. These are uh, data points that are pre um, aggregate in a certain way to speed up queries. And because that uses up a lot less space, we might decide to store that for a lot longer. We might have one that, especially for data with big histograms, complex metrics, like such as histograms, end up being a, a major consumer of space in terms of I.O. and storage and things like that. And maybe I have one for historical data that uses a different schema. And so this gives us the flexibility to support a lot of different use cases at the same time. Now, the really interesting stuff for recovery and persistence. Uh, what kind of stuff is persisted? Well, the raw time series data is, uh, per is persisted using uh, Kafka. And that's the, the raw metrics that are coming in. And the compressed columnar data is uh, persisted currently to Cassandra. And then we also persist some indexing data. So let's take a different view of things and look at it from a clustering standpoint. We use ACA cluster to connect different nodes. ACA cluster is used for shard management and dynamic reassignment of nodes and failure handling and things like that. 
So what we do is that we map the data for each shard to a, to a Kafka partition, and then nodes are assigned shards. We actually don't use Kafka's automatic uh, dynamic assignment because uh, we have so much state in each of our nodes that we don't want things moving around uh, with high frequency, as, you, as might happen uh, with the, the default uh, Kafka client. So this is the way that things get done. We assign things, and then we start pulling them into nodes. So what happens if one of these fails? Right? So let's say that this node that has shard 2 fails. Then what happens is that, uh, let's say you have a new node that comes up. Uh, the clustering would recognize this. We have a, um, we have a singleton. This would um, assign this node that data. It would start recovering data from Kafka. We actually don't read the data from Cassandra uh, automatically. This is read on demand. And the reason for this is because uh, time series data is usually write heavy, and the reading is a lot lighter. So we just read it from Cassandra on demand, which matches the Cassandra data model well, because it is you know, a key, key value. And um, what, what do we learn from all this? Right? Think about, like, it's pretty rare, I guess, for folks to be doing this is, is using the JVM. So I would say you know, pluses are that we have the huge ecosystem of JVM libraries that we can rely on, Aka Cluster, a Lucene, um, and very reliable clients for auto or major dependencies, things like that. Um, and the, the minuses are that you don't really have a, a uh, really good fine-grained control of low-level things. Right? We, we, we get it done today, but it's just not uh, anywhere near as pretty as it uh, could be. <laughs> There's a couple of things that would be really nice. Uh, I have a JVM wish list. For, for things that would help out a lot, such as having uh, value classes. There are some certain things in Scala that do help, such as Scala does have a value class, but it's not a true value class. So there are certain things like that that would help. Having actually safe typed uh, pointers, that, that would be a help. That would be a big help. Uh, there are certain other things like UTF-8, native UTF-8 strings that are coming to future versions of JDK that would also help. Some of it is in Growl that has been talked about several times in this talk. Um, a lot of it is in Project Panama, and some of it, I'm not sure when it's coming. So. And um, just to go over this uh, really quickly, we have, it's really good to get to know your GCs really, really well. <laughs> and I'll just point out one tool that we like a lot, which is called SJK. This is called, it stands for Swiss Java Knife. And it lets you gather all sorts of stuff from heaps to CPU analysis to you know, threat allocations uh, for our production systems. Today, we are, uh, our development actually happens open source. A lot of people don't know this, but Apple, uh, sorry. Um, we, the development actually does happen um, at uh, GitHub. And we're looking for uh, partners to partner with us uh, to work together. And so I encourage you to try it out. Uh, you can uh, actually gather metrics and look at it using a Grafana dashboard. And lastly, I'll just point out one thing on the, on the roadmap. Uh, one thing that is of great interest uh, is how do you get better observability for your data pipelines? Like, how can we help data engineers? A lot of these tools, oftentimes, like the data engineering world and the SRE and monitoring world are kind of completely separate. You know, and most data engineers have to figure this out themselves. But how can we have a tool that can actually uh, help analyze your batch job performance, your streaming job performance, your models, you know, your you know, stuff like that? What, what is important in that area? That, that is one thing that would love to have feedback on. So, um, Looking forward to talking to you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you yeah. very much. Uh, I'm sure there are questions, and we have plenty of time for them. Sure. So my first question is, what is the kind of data that this pipeline allows you to send via Kafka? So right, so, so the question is, what, uh, what kind of data? Is it like only JSON, JSON with schema, without schema, Avro? 
Oh, that. Uh, yeah, well, I can probably, like, it's probably not a quick, quick answer, um, so I, I can uh, talk to you about it. But, but for now, for the open source version, we uh, support a, um, an, a, a, a certain ingestion format that is uh, very popular in the metrics world. Yeah. Um, it's not very complicated. We simply uh, look at, uh, you know, we have sort of a resource manager kind of thing that we just look at. Here is the available nodes and, um, you know, how we can assign, assign stuff. Yeah. Good. Any more questions for Evan? Nope. Um, yeah. so at the Go end ahead. Of the talk, you mentioned you want to achieve high concurrency and easy debugging. Yeah. Those two kind of conflict with each other. It's pretty hard to debug concurrent programs. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely that? right. Um, I, I'm not sure I have like any like magic tricks, you know, to offer people. I, I think that I do think that uh, tracing is uh, pretty important for distributed <coughs> systems. That you kind of see where data goes and you know when things happen. That that's one thing that. Uh, I think we should keep improving support for. Uh, fortunately, th there are there are uh, there are a lot of libraries that are really helpful in the ecosystem. Like we use Kmon, for example, and Kmon is an open source uh, debugging or monitoring system that actually covers ACA and you know some other things like that. So it will help you monitor your actor mailbox and things like that. Um, so we just take advantage of as many of those tools as as possible and add a lot of visibility you know, ourselves. But, yeah, uh, thanks. Um, oh, uh, some more, oh, cool, some more questions. So are you making queries directly on compressed data or uncompressed data? Uh, yeah, so your question is, are we making queries directly on compressed data? Um, yeah, so actually today, our queries run uh, directly on uh, the com compressed data. Uh, the, the current format is done in such a way that we don't have to decompress to, to read from it. So that's kind of an advantage. Yeah. Um, sort of alongside that, uh, you were talking about uh, as you added attributes, uh, tags, it, it essentially created new time series. Um, how does that? fit back in sort of the, the query language and, and filter aggregation. So if I just queried on sort of right. the main name of the of the set of series, but it actually included 15, you know, sub tags. Right. Uh, yeah, then those would all be pulled in. So for example, if I, if I queried on data set equals time series, they would pull in both of these. Okay, so it's just yeah. gonna, it's gonna find both series and sort of it's merge, good, yeah. merge them. It'll find all of them and, and right, query. exactly, exactly, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's one of the things that is powerful about this approach. Yeah. yeah I guess, would you click one more? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. Do you have any uh, numbers for benchmark numbers comparing it to probably Prometheus or InfluxDB or other? Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's kind of difficult to, like, we do have those numbers that I shared earlier. Like when it comes to like, uh, it depends on what aspect you're talking about. I mean, I think the numbers here are, that I've shared are comparable to Prometheus in terms of like ingestion, for example, but it's really hard to compare because for example, Prometheus single is, is uh, a single node and, and our queries are distributed by default. So it, it's sort of difficult to, and the, and the data model is similar but not exactly the same. So it's, it's not like easy to um, you know, compare. Yep. I'm available for your questions if you know yeah. outside if you so guys are. Thanks everyone one more yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah.